when men striving together and hit a pregnant woman so that her children come out, but there is no harm. The one who hit her shall be surely fine. As the woman's husband shall impose on him, and he shall pay as the judges determine. But if there is harm, then you shall pay life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. Let's pray. Lord, as we open up your word and we ponder the old covenant, the law, I pray, Lord, that you open our eyes to the hope that the command ultimately brings as we stand condemned, yet we know that there's something greater. And that's your love, your grace, your death for us on the cross. God, help us to be transformed people in the way that we deal with those who hurt us. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. There are, in the United States, still some strange laws that are on the books today, believe it or not. I'm going to share with you some of those laws that you might find around the United States. There's a law in rural parts of Pennsylvania that requires that if you're driving a car, you stop every mile and send up a rocket signal. And as you're driving about, if you so happen to come across some skittish horses, you're required to disassemble your car, hide it in the bushes until the horses pass by. In New Jersey, it's illegal to wear a bulletproof vest while committing a murder. Like you would care, right? In Connecticut, a pickle's not a pickle until it officially bounces. In Idaho, it's illegal for a man to give his sweetheart a box of candy weighing more than 50 pounds. (laughs) I'm not sure if that's to protect the girl or to give all the other guys a better chance. I don't know. Now, there's also laws around the United States that relate to church or Sunday, the Lord's Day. In Salem, West Virginia, it's against the law to eat candy less than an hour and a half before a church service. In Winona Lake, Wisconsin, it's illegal to eat ice cream at a counter on Sunday, as well as it's illegal to order a slice of cherry pie with ice cream in Kansas. In Blackwater, Kentucky, tickling a woman under the chin with a feather duster in church, which we know this is a problem, is a $10 fine and a day in jail. They're serious about that one. Uh, no one can eat unshelled roasted peanuts while attending church in uh, a certain town in Oregon. I can't even pronounce the name. Um, and then one last one. Turtle races are not permitted within 100 yards of any church in Slaughter, Louisiana. Obviously, as we read these laws, they're outdated, they're unnecessary. For today, they don't even make sense. They just make us laugh because we just don't face the same sorts of things in our day that they did when the laws were written. And sometimes we approach the Old Testament that way when we read laws and we can't relate with having our ox stolen or our donkey falling into a pit. Uh, you know, those sorts of things are such a world away from where we live today. And so the Old Testament law, not only is it for a different time, a different culture, in the specifics of those laws, uh, we can still learn from these laws some amazing things as we study them in the cultural context. And some of these laws have a direct application even to relationships in our life today. We see that we learn three things by studying the Old Testament law. It's worth your time because, number one, We learn the character of God behind the law. When you understand in the cultural context why it was given and how God is protecting, say, slaves or women or animals and so on, you see God's heart through the law. Secondly, the law, when you read it through, it doesn't take long to realize that you are a law breaker. 
Just read the Ten Commandments. And you'll learn you're a lawbreaker. And so, through that, you learn that you're a sinner. The law becomes a mirror which shows you all your flaws and imperfections. You ever look at one of those mirrors that's like a magnifying mirror? And all your pores pop out, and you're like, oh, no! Turn it around to the normal side, right? That's what the law is like. It reveals your faults. But then, thirdly, the law points forward to our need for a Savior. And so, the law constantly is pointing forward to who will save us from ourselves, from our sin, from the judgment that we deserve. And so, even in the law, as we were studying this last week in chapters 21 and 22, we saw pictures of Christ in the law. And so, if you haven't been to a Thursday night verse-by-verse Bible study, I'd encourage you to show up and uh, join us for dinner and a Bible study and worship. Mackenzie brings her little guitar. It's a little keyboard that you can hold like a guitar. Anyway, I always thought that was really cool. Reminds me of the 80s. But come out, study the Bible with us, and uh, enjoy some good fellowship. But imagine, what would society be without laws? I think it only takes a natural disaster to figure out what that turns into. Uh, When we have a hurricane that uh, causes mass destruction in a city. I mean, see what happens to society as it begins to unravel and people loot and shoot one another and things get crazy. Laws are there because people are inherently sinful. Jeremiah 17.9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? So without restraints, what would our hearts be tempted to do? When you look through the Old Testament laws, there's so many weird laws. There's so many, there's 613 laws listed in the Old Testament. And so we see there are so many specific laws that deal with uh, kind of weird things because people do weird, disgusting, perverted things. And so when you read through those laws and you find one that makes you blush, well, it's human nature. It causes that law to have to exist. And it's that way in our society as well. We have so many laws because people will do the things they shouldn't do if there's not a law to tell them not to. So God gives these laws as a just and civil standard for Israelite society, for a holy people that live different from the nations around them. And so you'll see God's law take things to a whole new level, above and beyond what the other nations are doing. And so the law keeps order, and it helps us people to live a holy life. Now, after hearing all that, when it comes to the New Testament, and somebody asks Jesus, what's the first command, first and greatest commandment? And Christ said that the first and greatest commandment is this, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. And so, if we were to live by just those two commands, Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. The need for all the other laws evaporates. Because we don't do things that hurt our relationship with God. And we won't do things that will hurt our neighbor or our spouse or our kids. You see, when it comes to our relationship with God, and we meet Jesus Christ, and He transforms our life, we are those who don't need to be governed by laws like the Old Testament, but now we're governed by the Spirit of God. Now we're governed by the love for God and the love for one another. But as we look in the law, it does serve a purpose, as I explained. It reveals God's character. It shows that we're sinners, and it points towards our need for Jesus Christ. It serves that purpose, and we see that in the first point, that justice is getting just what you deserve. And so, the example that we're reading today, in, starting in verse 22, it said, When men strive together and hit a pregnant woman so that her children come out, but there is no harm, but one who hit her shall surely be fined, as the woman's husband shall impose on him, and he shall pay as the judges determine. 
But if there is harm, then you shall pay life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, and it goes on. And so this occurs in the midst of a law or laws concerning personal injury. What do you do if somebody hits you, hurts you, um, or kills you? And so in this instance, there's the men that are in a fight. They hit a pregnant woman, and the, the child comes out. And the issue is, is there an injury to the woman or to the child? And mind you, this child is in a fetus. This child is a living being, a human being, that's still in the womb. And so if that child comes out and is dead, it says life for life. It says bruise for bruise, you know, wound for wound. And so the penalty is in proportion to the severity of the damage, either to the child or to the mother. And so we see here a principle laid out where the punishment is equal to but not greater than the damage done. And that is what we would call just. This is known as lex talionis, the law of retaliation, the eye for eye, two for two. Usually, when we get hurt, we want the person that hurt us to suffer more than we suffer. That's human nature. So in its day, this eye for eye command kept things in a just realm, um, an equal punishment. The punishment would fit the crime. And so it wasn't for the person that got injured to take into their own hands, but rather for the judges or the authorities, um, God's divinely appointed leaders, to use these laws as a standard, as a basis, to judge each situation and to dole out judgment accordingly. And so they would take the 613 commands as their law book and approach each situation accordingly. But there's no record of them actually poking out somebody's eye or another person's eye getting hurt by them. But what we do find is that there's evidence that they rather made another person or the perpetrator pay so that it hurt them as much as it hurt the victim. So they didn't become um, necessarily mutilators of people's bodies uh, to take out justice on one another, but rather they were looking for how can we make this hurt this person as much as it hurt the other for losing their eye. Some of the punishments that we see in history with regards to how Israel carried this out was banishment, loss of property, confinement, financial penalties, corporal punishment, or even public humiliation. Now, in the case of premeditated murder, there was only one consequence, and that was life for life. In Numbers 35-31, it says that there's no opportunity for that person to buy or be redeemed out of that judgment. It says... Moreover, you shall accept no ransom for the life of a murderer who is guilty of death. He shall pay, or he shall be put to death. And so we see that how this was applied uh, varied on the situation until it came to murder. It was always the same. But the point was to see justice done. I mean, don't you watch the news sometimes and wonder where's the justice in the world? how crimes can be committed and people get off scot-free or get off with just a year in jail or whatever it may be, and we think, you know, where's the justice? This justice that we see in the Old Testament would even be just enough to keep rich people from buying their way out of the justice they deserve if they had just judgment. Now, the law provides justice in an unjust world. And so it is a good standard. It's a holy thing as we look at it in its context. And as we often cry out for justice, uh, when we're wrong, we want justice. But guess what? When you're a sinner... What do you want? Mercy. Exactly. 
Well, as much as we've cried out for justice in the world, I think my question to you is, do you really want justice? Honestly, for yourself, do you want justice? Well, let's look what the Bible says about justice in the New Testament. There's a verdict um, about you that God, the ultimate judge, gives about you. And it says in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so that's his verdict. Everybody's a sinner. All have broken the commandments of God. And there's also a judgment based on that verdict, and it's this in Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is what? Death. Now, when you read through some of the Old Testament laws, there was a lot of uh, consequences of death. If a child hit a parent, consequence, death. If a child cursed a parent, consequence, death. Um, for a sorceress, consequence, death. Um, so we look in the Old Testament law, and it's pretty harsh, it seems, but it is completely just given by a holy God. And so we don't realize, oftentimes as sinners, we don't understand how sinful we really are or how much sin really does deserve separation from God, eternal. You know, for a holy God, this is what he lays out. For us, we're kind of blind to it. I mean, does a fish really know that it's swimming in water? Probably not, you know. It's just where it lives. We don't think oftentimes about ourselves living in oxygen um, in nitrogen and some other gases but we just don't think about it because this is the world we live in and that's what it's like with sin we're in the midst of sin and we're sinners ourselves we don't realize how bad we actually stink to God it's kind of like when you've been eating corn nuts right they taste great you know you've been eating them and you come and you talk to your wife and she's all oh man Go brush your teeth, you know. You don't realize what's going on. That's what it's like for sinners before a holy God. We don't realize how much of, a, of an offense we've actually committed. We don't realize how serious it is. But God's word lets us know that the wages of sin is death. But, the rest of the verse, the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so there's good news do we want justice? Hopefully not. Hopefully, we cry out for mercy. And that's the second point. Mercy is not receiving the punishment that you deserve. If we go into the New Testament, one of the gentlemen we see in the New Testament, the, the hero of many Christians, his name is Paul. But before he was known as Paul, his name was Saul. And Saul was the arch-persecutor of the early church. He put to death the first martyr, Stephen. And he oversaw the persecution of many other Christians. I mean, he was on his way to Damascus. He was going to foreign cities to chase down Christians and imprison them and put them to death. That's Saul. But guess what? God reached out to Saul in his sin and in his evil activity, and saved him. Saul becomes a Christian, and then the Christians are shocked, and they, they just don't even believe him at first. But God gives a sign so that uh, you know those that receive him will know. But, you know, Paul had to go back to that church in Jerusalem, and the Christians had to go through a process of actually getting over their own issues with Saul killing their friends, a separating mother and child, father and wife, and putting them in prison. I mean, you know how hard that would be? But thank God for his grace that he saved Saul, yet at the same time, the Christians were required to receive him into the body. We're not told a lot about that process, but I'm sure that was a difficult one. And so that mercy is something God calls us to as Christians. As people who have experienced His amazing grace and mercy, now we give it to those who have hurt us. In relation to those laws of personal injury, remember that's the context. 
How has somebody personally injured you in your history, in your past? Through words or actions? You know, maybe there's a person that just comes to mind. And that memory chases you all over the place. Everywhere you go. Every day you ponder it. And, and it's messing up your life. Well, Jesus points us to a new kind of living as Christians. In Luke 6.37, he says this, Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, crushed down, shaking together, running over, will be put into your lap, for with the measure that you use it, it will be measured back to you. So when I read God's Word and I know how much of a sinner I am, I know every day how much I might falter in little things. <coughs> I know I need mercy. If I need mercy, and God's Word says if I give mercy, I'll receive mercy, you know what? I better be given mercy. I'd rather give mercy and receive mercy than to give justice and receive justice. That's what God's Word says. If you want to judge other people and, and make them pay for what they did to you, then where's God's mercy in our life? That's hard. God is the ultimate judge. Now understand, in our society, we do have judges that are placed uh, in our government system, and it is their job to take criminals and put them in jail or make them pay for what they did but it's not your job. So that's a provision for, from God. Those judges are a provision from, from God that's from Texas side. But on a personal level, it's not our job to carry out eye for eye, two for two. It's our job to give mercy. One day, whoever it is that has wronged us will have to stand before the ultimate judge. But understand, we are still not the judge. Only God is. In Romans 12, 17, it says, Repay no one for evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so as far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. So it's not our job to be the judge or the avenger. It's God's. And so what we're supposed to do and cease and desist and allow God to do what he will, but we give mercy. And so forgiveness is a way to show mercy. And Jesus makes it clear his heart for a forgiveness and restoration for the sinner in our relationship with those who hurt us when we look in Matthew 18. In verse 21, Peter came up to him and said this, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? <coughs> now Peter probably thinks he's being generous, right? Seven times? And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. Or, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, 77 times. Or in another one, it says 70 times 7. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wishes to settle accounts with his servants. And so now he's going to go into a parable to illustrate the truth that he just said. How many times? 77 times. Which is a way of saying complete. Always. Or 70 times 7. Uh, continuously, we forgive. Well, how do we illustrate that? Well, Jesus is going to give us this parable of a king who went to settle the accounts for, with, with debtors, people that owed him money. And it says, when he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. That's something that's hard to understand, perhaps, in our day, but let me explain to you what 10,000 talents is. One talent is 20 years wages. Okay? That's one talent. A talent is the highest known denomination of any currency in the 
ancient Roman world. When we come to the number 10,000, 10,000 was the highest number for which the Greek language had any particular word for. It. So they took, or Jesus takes, the highest denomination of money, 20 years wages, it was understood, and the highest number that the, the Roman language had, and he put them together. So what does he say? The ultimate debt. The one that cannot be paid. In our language today, it would be billions, trillions of dollars. In verse 25, And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. And so, as we read in chapter 21 of Exodus, there are times when people would sell themselves into slavery to pay off a debt. And so that's what the king um, could have done. In verse 26, So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. Yeah, right. Like that's possible. 10,000 times 20 years. That's a lot of years of labor. Possible. But verse 27, And out of pity or compassion, the kind of compassion we see Jesus expressed towards people in the gospel, that word that is this gut-wrenching um, compassion for another person, out of pity for him. The, ma- the master of that servant released him and forgave him his debt. So the, for the people listening to this parable, that point was shocking. you got to be kidding. He just let him go? Not even into slavery? And they, maybe they had relatives that had sold themselves into slavery to pay off their personal debts. In verse 28, But when that same servant went out, he went and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. Now, a denarii is a day's wage. So a hundred days worth of wage. One third of a year. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, Hey, what you owe? Now contrast the mercy he just received with the viciousness by which he's attacking somebody who owes him a far lesser amount of money. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. A shameful response to a man that had been forgiven so much that he would demand justice to somebody who owed him an inconceivably small amount compared to what he owed. In verse 31, when his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me, and should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant? as I had mercy on you. And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also, my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. And those words come down like a hammer. Oh! Thunderous echo. Are you kidding me? I have to forgive so-and-so? Well, yeah, because that's what God says. If we want His mercy for an inconceivably large debt that we could not pay, which His very own Son, who was pure and innocent, had to pay on your behalf, if we're forgiven that debt, how can we not forget a debt that it may be large, but compared to what we owe to God? That's hard truth. You know, when you look in the Old Testament, you see that Old Covenant. There's no mercy. Boom. Judgment. Eye for eye. Two for two. Life for life. Do you want that covenant? Or do you want the new covenant? Where there's mercy and grace and forgiveness. You know, if we want that new covenant personally, we've got to live accordingly. 
Which life are you living practically? Are you living according to the Old Covenant? Calling yourself a New Testament Christian, yet you carry out this vengeance on your own? Or are you living this New Testament life that is transformed by the love of Christ? Where you give mercy to the one who's hurt you? You know, just on a practical side, if you don't forgive, bitterness will eat you up from the inside out. It will destroy your other relationships. It will make you stressed out. It will make you freak out. You'll, you'll have mental problems. Uh, you'll be dysfunctional relationally. Spiritually, you'll experience atrophy. And you won't grow. Unforgiveness is pretty serious stuff. And so Jesus tells us to pray in Matthew 6.12. And like in every day practice and forgive us our debts as we have also what given our debt and so I make that a part of my daily prayer and it's funny you know sometimes I even revisit the same person you know because yeah I let it go one day and then for some reason the enemy stirs up a little bit of anger again and I have to let it go again. It's like this constant maintenance. And then one day, you're free of it. And what a blessing that is. You know, when God gives you that strength, and sometimes He gives you the strength right off the bat. But sometimes you struggle through forgiveness, and it is a hard thing. But let it go. Don't say, You owe me, I'm going to make you pay. Say, Christ paid for me. You don't owe me anything. I'm the richest person in the universe because of what God's done for me. You don't owe me anything. Mercy is better than judgment. James, chapter 2, verse 13. It says this, For judgment without mercy, or for judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Hold on to that truth. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Judgment will always take you down. Mercy will always set you free. And that leads us to the last point. Grace. Grace is different from mercy. Grace is being gifted with blessings that you don't deserve. Gifted with blessings you don't deserve. Not just forgiven, but enriched. Jesus goes a step further than mercy when he explains this great principle in Matthew 5, 38. And these verses have been offensive to many for generations because it's so hard to conceive of giving grace to your enemy. But this is what he says. Uh, you have heard that it was said... An eye for an eye and a tooth for two. Just what we read today. You've heard that it was said in the law, Jesus said. But he says, I say to you, do not resist, which means to take legal action against, the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, which that would hurt, but it's also, you got to understand, a great insult to be slapped on the cheek. So it's not just a physical assault. This is an assault on your dignity. That goes deeper than the physical hurt. Um, Jesus said, turn to him the other also. And if anyone sue you and take your tunic, which was the inner garment worn against the skin, let him have your cloak as well. Which, according to the Old Testament law, you couldn't take somebody's cloak overnight because not only was it a very expensive piece of clothing, but it was a very important one because it served as a covering but it also served as your blanket at night. God said a law because he has compassion on people that don't take their cloak. But Jesus said, hey, if they take your tunic, give them your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, which in that day it was a thousand paces, that was the term. We just say mile in our Bible translations. It's kind of close. 
about 2,000 feet off, but go with him two miles. And so what happens is a soldier could say, you, carry my bag or my luggage for a mile, and you were required by law in that day to pick it up by Roman law and carry it for a, a, a mile for, for that uh, thousand paces. Jews hated that because it reminded them that they were subject to Rome and they were no longer an autonomous nation, a sovereign state. So that first mile, Jesus says, do it, but go a second mile. That first mile was not your choice. You had to do it. The second mile is your choice offered. In verse 42, uh, give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. We see this generous spirit there as well. The natural way to deal with those who hurt us is to retaliate. The supernatural way to deal with those who hurt us is to give them more than they deserve, to actually bless them, which is to do the very opposite of what your flesh is crying out for. But because of what God's done in your life, your spirit cries out, bless them. Only God can give you that kind of strength. Now, let me clear this up, too. This passage that I just read is not saying that you need to be a doormat to everybody, but rather, it's a passage of strength where you choose by your own volition to not insist on your personal rights. You see, it doesn't mean anything if you're out of control and you're forced, but rather if you have the power to offer the other cheek, you have the power to go the extra mile, then you do that out of your own decision, your own volition. It's a decision of strength, not of weakness. So giving grace to the person that doesn't deserve it. You know, by doing that, we actually follow in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. If we remember that video we showed right before the message, what Jesus went through on that cross, he set the example for it. And so he suffered all sorts of insults and personal injuries. You know how many times he was hit and treated without dignity or respect? He was injured physically, and he was injured in that emotional way as well on his way to the cross. But he never stopped and demanded eye for eye, tooth for tooth. In Isaiah 50, verse 6, it says, I gave my back to those who strike and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I did not face from disgrace and spitting. I did not hide my face from disgrace and spitting. See, that's Christ. and The way he approached the cross the great gift of eternal life, those who were actually against him, he said, you know, I'm doing this for you. He decided to do it for them. I mean, he could have snapped his finger and turned them, turned them into dust. But he didn't. In Luke 23, verse 34, he actually prayed from the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Pretty intense. Giving grace goes further than mercy. Luke's account of this teaching says this in Luke 6.27, But I say to you, who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. And it goes on. Love your enemies? I mean, the common understanding was, you know, you love those who love you, you hate those who hate you. And that was accepted as being okay. But Jesus is calling us to something supernatural and above what the flesh does, above what the Old Testament law offers, and something that he brings in the New Testament, this mercy and grace to love your enemies. And then in verse 31 of Luke 6, it says, And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. Put your self in the shoes of the perpetrator of the crime. How would you like to be treated? Not with justice, but 
so we treat them as we would want to be treated. Walking like Jesus Christ looks a whole lot different from walking like the world. We're offered a lot of examples of what um, manly men do when people hurt them. Uh, you watch movies, TV shows. I mean, we're surrounded with it. We see it daily at work. But Jesus offers something that you might not see very often at all. And in fact, you might be the only person that you know that actually takes a step of offering grace to an enemy when everybody around you is saying, what in the world? They might think you're crazy for a while. But God doesn't leave that kind of stuff uh, without fruit. You know, people that you offer His mercy and grace to are shocked. And quite possibly, they end up coming to Christ. And then your friends are like, whoa. I didn't think what you were doing was good, but now I can see the fruit of it, and this is amazing. I've never seen anything like it before. Walking like Jesus looks a whole lot differently from the kingdom of the world. In Romans 12, verse 20, it says, To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Which I won't go into all that, but it understood as being a, a blessing. Verse 21. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with Good. And there's a great principle. As you look at your life, are you overcome by evil easily? Do you respond to evil in like kind? Does evil chase you around all day long in your thoughts, in your, in your emotions, and you can't let it go? Not forgiving somebody, being angry at somebody, really, the only person you're hurting is yourself because the person that hurt you probably doesn't care. Does it really work? No way. So we overcome evil with good, and that's the way the children of the light walk in a dark world. So today's message is not an easy one. And you, you might be even offended at the fact that we're talking about this today. It might be really hard. If you don't have the strength to do what we're talking about, if you think it's impossible, then you've got to come down to the foot of the cross and find your strength in what Jesus did for you first. That's where you're going to find the strength. You know, some years ago, I talked to a youth group about forgiving others, and I read the verse uh, in Matthew chapter 6 that talks about if you don't forgive somebody, your Father won't forgive you. Heavenly Father won't forgive you. And afterwards... One of the toughest guys in the youth group um, came up to me following. And he was really broken up because he lived with his grandparents. It was his birthday that day. He hadn't seen his parents in who knows how long. And he was heartbroken that neither of them cared to call and wish him a happy birthday. I mean, that kind of hurt. You can't relate with unless you're going through it yourself. And he was broken. He's like, I don't know how I can forgive them. With everything that they've done. They destroyed their own lives. They destroyed my life. And this was the only answer that God gave me in the moment. Is the only place you're going to find the strength to forgive like that is by experiencing God's mercy and grace in your own life first. When you understand His mercy and grace, and you experience it personally, then the Spirit of God gives you the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. I mean, all these things start coming out of your life because it's the Spirit of God. His strength, His work in you. You can't produce that on your own. No matter how hard you try, it's not going to come out of you, but it will come with the strength of the Spirit. It will come through experiencing the mercy and grace of Jesus Christ. And you might not be able to explain it. You might not be able to take a class in order to gain that ability. 
but God can give it to you. But remember where your grace begins. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It's the gift of God. Not a result of works, so that no one may boast. If you find yourself thinking you've earned your salvation, there's no way you're going to forgive anybody. But when you know you deserved hell, and God gave you eternal life, then you have the experience to be able to forgive somebody who's hurt you. And so, in your life, have you experienced the grace of God? Even as we talk about all these things, I want you to understand this one thing, that God does not stop being just in order to be gracious. It isn't like he turns off a switch in his justice part of his life and turns on a switch in grace, the grace part of his life. No, God is just and gracious at the same time. Because of that, that's why Jesus had to die. Because you deserve justice, and justice had to be fulfilled. And so Jesus said, I'll do it. I'll die on the cross for all their sin. Past, present, future. For the things that you're ashamed of, the things that nobody knows that you've done. Jesus knew it all. And he's the one that said, I volunteer. I will pay the price before a just father. So when he died on that cross, that payment was paid. He said, it is finished, which means paid in full. The justice has been fulfilled, but now the question for you is, will you receive his act on your behalf? Or will you stay hard-hearted and say, no, I'm going to pay it myself? Because God gives us that choice. You can receive price payment or you can receive justice. And when we receive the payment that Jesus gave for us, what we receive instead is something totally different. It's mercy, forgiveness, and grace, eternal life. We're adopted as children of God. We're given the Holy Spirit. We become temples of God because the Holy Spirit indwells us. I mean, there are things that are so amazing that we've received, you can't even understand them yet. They're somewhat of a mystery. Read the book of Ephesians if you want to understand your riches in Christ. It's a great book. But where do you stand? For God's justice or His mercy and grace? And so today, let's respond to Him in prayer. Let's bow our heads. If you know you need mercy and grace today, pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, thank you for taking the justice I deserve as you died on that cross. I receive the free gift of grace that you offer us. I receive the righteousness that you cover me with so that I can enter a relationship with you. Lord, help me to live for you. Help me to live by these supernatural principles in my life that I might show now mercy and grace as I've received the greatest mercy and grace I've ever known. And Lord, help us to be strong, every one of us, to not give way to the ways of the world, to not live like old covenant believers, but transform children of God in this dark world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.